end of these two presentations, I propose that we move on now to invite Thomas E. Hill to describe. Tom, a longtime friend, describes himself thus. I am a librarian and medievalist interested in technologies of mind and memory. I hold a PhD in English from Columbia University with a specialization in medieval literature, and my scholarship concerns the reading of courtly romance in the context of scholastic philosophy and psychology. I am librarian of the Vassar College Art Library and teach courses in allegory and Chaucer in the Vassar College Department of English. My book, this one, She, This in Black, Vision, Truth, and Will in Geoffrey Chaucer's Trollus and Crusade was published in 2006. At present, I am working on an essay on Edna St. Vincent Millay and a book of essays entitled The Automaton in the Archive, Post-Human Memories. I also host the Library Cafe, a weekly radio interview program aired on station WVKR, about scholarship libraries and the formation and circulation of knowledge. For a biographical interview with Millie Budney on the Library Cafe, we'll put a link in the chat where you could, following the link, listen. Now, he will examine Psyche's library, reading the library as a text illuminated by the Cupid and Psyche tapestries in the Frederick Thompson Memorial Library at Vassar College. Tom, please. I, uh, Millie, I'll try to share screen. Let's hope it works. So share screen. And um, this is it. Share. Thank you, Millie, for that introduction. And thank you and the research group for inviting me to talk about the Vassar Library as a kind of living text in itself. I also am grateful to Julia Bolton Holloway and the Academia of Vassarione, which sponsored the first iteration of this talk a couple of months ago. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm going to be talking about literal texts as evidence, that is, textiles, a series of five Gobelin tapestries, and I'll also be reading the Vassar Library itself as a text. I'm going to set these readings in the historical context of the women who were influential here at Vassar in its early years between the Civil War and the First World War, and building what at the time was a revolutionary undergraduate curriculum which privileged research based on direct experience, as well as a magnificent library to support that curriculum. And the library is still central to our mission and integrated into our educational practices today. It's not an accident, surely, that Millie, having graduated from Vassar with this background, has bestowed on our disciplines the research group on manuscript evidence. And as a nod to my own interest in phenomenology, I'll also place my talk in my own experience of teaching an allegory seminar for first year students within this library, and the effect that these texts the tapestries and the library have on my students and have had on former Vassar students in a tradition that is itself living and material. And by that I mean it is passed on orally through people and the built environment, but not officially codified or prescribed in any way. On the screen is a view of the tapestries from the floor of the front hall in the crossing of the Thompson Memorial Library up into the library tower. To give you an idea of the size of the space, the front hall is a 40 foot cube with an additional 10 feet between the bottom of the frieze here and the ceiling boards. And then there is above the ceiling boards a room about the same size square and about 20 feet high that you can access from this turret behind this archer's embrasure or meurtrier via a winding staircase where there is a 
grated door and a lock that prevents you from just walking up there. And there's nothing in this room except for windows looking out on the town and the landscape of the Hudson Valley and a winch by which one can lower this great Corona chandelier to the floor so that one can change the light bulbs. And this is a view looking from the tower down the nave of the Thompson Library, erected in 1905. This library was the central engine of an effort on the part of mostly female faculty who taught here in the early years of the college. These women believed that they were engaged in a project to build a curriculum and an edifice of learning which would help women influence the political life of the United States in the aftermath of the horror of the Civil War. Vassar is the second institution in the United States to be chartered to grant academic degrees to women, the first being Elmira College, also in New York State, which opened 10 years before Vassar in 1855. Vassar's model is an important chapter in an as yet unwritten history of the influence of what were called female seminaries in the 19th century on American education, culture, and politics. These seminaries in which many of these early Vassar faculty were educated seem to spring up through a kind of spontaneous combustion across the United States, especially in New England and Western New York State. Of course, these institutions didn't actually arrive out of nowhere. They were addressing a need for teachers. Often founded and administered by women, they are part of a response to a larger story that begins with the founding of the first universities in the early 13th century and the exclusion of women from the world of letters in Europe at this time, a meta-history traced by Julia Bolton Holloway in her book, Equally in God's Image. My feminist colleagues at Columbia used to say Julia's introduction to that book should be as influential as Curtius's and Auerbach's histories of medieval letters, but alas, it really hasn't been built upon and still hides, as it were, in plain sight, but I did add it to our bibliography. The image here is of four female seminaries with which are associated three important Vassar women I'm going to be speaking about, Matthew Vassar's niece, Lydia Booth, Mary Clark Thompson, and Lucy Maynard Salmon. Lydia Booth founded the Cottage Hill Seminary here in Poughkeepsie, seen at the top left. Mary Thompson attended the Ontario Seminary on the lower left. Lucy Salmon attended the Fowley Seminary in Fulton, New York, where her mother had been principal of the institution's earlier incarnation as the Fulton Female Seminary. And Salmon's mother herself had attended the Ipswich Seminary in Massachusetts, presided over by that pioneer of female education, Mary Lyon, whom I'll mention later. This was a kind of mothership of these seminaries. The reading of the library as an historical text at Vassar doesn't begin with me. It was actually once a college requirement for all students and begins explicitly with Lucy Maynard Salmon, depicted here on the left in her early years at Vassar by a studio art student in a painting that now resides in our Francis Lehman Loeb Art Center, and then on the right in a photograph of her at about the same age where she appears in the portrait. Lucy's mother, as I mentioned, had studied at the famous Ipswich Female Seminary in Massachusetts, presided over by Mary Lyon, who would go on to found the Mount Holyoke and Wheaton Female Seminaries that would become colleges later. Many of Lyon's graduates took up her wish that they become missionaries of female education, founding, administering, and teaching in seminaries themselves, and Salmon's mother was the first principal of the Fulton Seminary in New York. Lucy herself attended the Fowley Seminary, into which the Fulton Seminary was reincorporated in 1857. Lucy then went on to receive a BA and an MA in history at the University of Michigan before she came to teach history at Vassar in 1887, where she was made full professor in 1889. In her essay entitled On the College Professor, published in the Library Journal in 1911, Salmon describes the lectures administered to all Vassar students who were required to take an introductory history course where the library serves as a document in itself. 
And I'll read a short quotation since it indicates very eloquently Salmon's emphasis on direct experience in her vision of scholarship and learning. So the passage reads, at the beginning of the college year, the second time each section meets, every section is met by the head of the history department and an illustrated lecture given on the library and its use. This lecture shows the library building must be studied as a record of conditions that have passed away, that it must be studied as a building on whose walls history is written, and that it must be studied with reference to the use it serves. The Vassar College Library building is of the ecclesiastical type and its students are shown that this type is a record of the time when all learning and all education were controlled by the church and libraries were for the most part attached to ecclesiastical foundations and controlled by them. That books were first kept in the cloister, that when separate buildings were erected, libraries were public only in the sense that all connected with the foundation had access to them. And then she goes on to explain how the chained book, the book stack, the printed book, and eventually the open shelf trace a gradual democratization of learning as barriers between the book and the reader are removed. And then finally, she turns to the visual program of the Thompson Library and writes, but our college library is not only a record, it has also much history written on its walls. The great west window emblazons in stained glass a part of the history of Lady Helen Lucretia Cornaro Piscopia, who received the degree of Doctor of Philosophy at the University of Padua in 1678. Carved on its walls are the college and university seals of the great educational institutions of America and England. Hanging on the walls of the great entrance memorial hall is a series of tapestries narrating the history of a meeting of the Council of the Gods on Mount Olympus. Its windows contain in leaded panes the printer's marks of all the early leading printers of England and the continent. It is hoped that every student will thus see in the library building itself a record and a history of the past. And then Salmon finishes the essay describing how students are introduced to the apparatus of library research, including the organizational and referential elements of books and journals and to the library cataloging system. Lucy isn't the only member of the faculty who places a premium on direct experience in the education of young women. The college's first faculty hire, Mariah Mitchell, educated in natural history by her Quaker father and librarian mother, was a famous astronomer who discovered a comet and was one of the first individuals to combine photography and a telescope to document astronomical changes, which led to, among other things, her now undisputed theory of the nature of sunspots. She actually invented the apparatus that allowed one to take a photograph through a telescope in the early days of photography. One of the first buildings on campus was erected for her, the observatory seen here on the right, designed by the scientist and polymath Charles Farrar, who had also been hired by Matthew Vassar for his science faculty, in his case hired away from Elmira College. Mariah lived and worked in the observatory for 23 years, eventually moving her aging father in to live with her. Mariah was a committed feminist and suffragist and an advocate for the need for more women scientists. She argued that imagination is as much needed in science as logic and mathematical ability, and that science has much in common with poetry. And she would host dome parties in the observatory once a year where students were urged to recite their own poetry, a tradition that was carried on until fairly recently. Also, Matthew Vassar, the wealthy brewer who founded the college, was self-educated and had taught himself to read and write. He equipped the college at its founding with a substantial book collection and an art collection, insisting that he wanted his students to study original works of art and not copies. Vassar's niece, Lydia Booth, who had attended Sarah Pierce's Litchfield Female Academy in Connecticut, 
was the founder and principal of a female seminary here in Poughkeepsie, and it was she who gave Vassar the idea for creating a degree-granting college for women. Lucy Salmon, historian that she was, referred to Lydia as the real founder of the college. And then on the right, you can see the art collection with a group of students from the very early history of the college in the main building. But Salmon's contribution is extraordinary, and she is something of a revolutionary in the fields of history and education both. Her history research hinges on the examination of immediate material reality, and though there were other historians who advocate for this, as a practitioner, she has no equal and is a good hundred years ahead of her time. A list of titles of her historical essays reflects this, and I'll just read a handful. Our Kitchen, The Family Cookbook, History in a Backyard, The City and the World of Objects, The Record of Monuments, how far can the past be reconstructed from the press, the historical museum? In her teaching, she would have her students derive historical narratives from evidence in the world around them, ways of migration from place names, histories of education from desks and chairs in classrooms, histories of property and community from backyard fences, ethnographies and natural histories from restaurant menus, social and cultural histories from architectural styles of domestic and public buildings, and documentary histories from history books as objects themselves. She had the library collect menus, railroad schedules, and even, as you see here on the right, laundry lists from which she had her students derive these histories. She once famously had her students write an examination essay using railroad schedules to describe the history of American westward expansion. Her motto, go to the source, is still spoken reverently by faculty, students, and alumni at Vassar. This pedagogy is enabled by a larger educational evolution Salmon is carrying forward that of the introduction of the research seminar into higher education. Most, if not all, undergraduate education in America when Salmon arrives at Vassar in 1886 is conducted along the old medieval lines of the lecture and the examination, which is dependent on a lecturer imparting authoritative knowledge to a group of students who are not expected to do more than commit to memory the content of the text and reproduce it in appropriate ways. The idea of research as it was developed in the German universities and through the seminar system was only known at most to graduate students. William Clark's book, Academic Charisma and the Origins of the Research University lays out the distinction based on an historical analysis of his own of academic furniture like the chair, the table, and the card catalog quite beautifully. And Stephen Jagger's book, The Envy of Angels, fills in the charismatic element in this narrative by discussing the application of the liberal arts in the cathedral schools of the 10th and the 11th centuries. The difference in these pedagogies is that the product of the medieval university and its predecessor, the cathedral school, is the individual soul, the student on the charismatic model, and the product of the research university is knowledge itself requiring libraries and accruing increasing knowledge, almost like wealth increases itself in a banking system through returns on investment. The early seminars took place in the professor's home and were modeled somewhat on professional training in the guilds. The shift in the German universities takes place from the end of the 17th century into the 19th century, and then on the screen here are two 18th century prints depicting an early law school seminar at the University of Gießen, and then on the right, the library of the University of Göttingen. You can see in the seminar scene here at Gießen, the a professor teaching in his home. You know this is the professor here seated because he's in his bathrobe, so you know he's at home. And interestingly, the room itself requires a small library and even a blackboard. And then here you have this uh, very beautiful uh, print of the library at Göttingen. 
Salmon's knowledge of the system as an historical researcher derives from her time at the University of Michigan studying under this individual, another educational visionary, Charles Kendall Adams. Adams had traveled to Germany to observe their system of training researchers, and he was known at Michigan for having introduced the seminar to his graduate history courses. And Adams will go on to found graduate programs and great research libraries at Cornell and the University of Wisconsin, in these cases as these institutions' presidents. These are libraries he founded at both institutions, the Urus Library at Cornell on the left and the Wisconsin Library in Madison on the right, which doubled as the Wisconsin State Library. Lucy is very much of the same school as her mentor, but she has what I believe is the inspired and profound insight that apart from forming the basis of graduate education as a path to training scholars and scientists to create new knowledge, the seminar could help young women to discover a direct path to learning rather than having to rely on the authority of men lecturing to them about what constitutes knowledge. So she introduces the seminar to her classes at Vassar. This is an early example taken in the 19th century of one of Lucy's seminars in her apartment in main building at Vassar. Lucy's seated at the end of the table here with the bow tie, not in her bathrobe. Salmon attempts to get the college administration to install seminar rooms in the new classroom buildings that are being erected at the turn of the century, but she's blocked by an administration that isn't itself at all as progressive as its new faculty and many of its students. The face of this administration is President James Monroe Taylor, who won't allow seminar rooms in new buildings like Rockefeller Hall, shown here on the right. By this time, at the turn of the century, many faculty and students are agitating for the female suffrage movement. And Taylor also attempts to bar bringing suffragists like Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was a friend actually of Mariah Mitchell and whose own daughter was a student at Vassar, and other reformers like Jane Addams to speak on campus. However, Salmon does find a formidable ally in this woman in the widow of an exceedingly wealthy trustee, Frederick Ferris Thompson, founder of what eventually would become Chase Manhattan Bank in New York. She is Mary Clark Thompson, daughter of a New York state governor and also a product of the female seminary system. In her case, this was the Ontario Female Seminary in her home in Canandaigua, New York, where her sister would eventually become principal. To the delight of the faculty who wanted to build a research curriculum for undergraduates at Vassar, Thompson offers to build a freestanding campus library as a memorial to her late husband. The same year the Thompson Library was finished in 1905, she erected this temple to Diana on her estate in Canandaigua, which I think attests along with a library to her feminism since the building of this library is something of a statement of female self-empowerment in itself. Thompson also at about this time funded a professorship to found Vassar's political science department, which has its home in Rockefeller Hall today. And you might wanna take note of Mary's intellectual pose here, which we will see again. I have no doubt that it was at the prompting of Lucy Salmon and other faculty whom Salmon had enlisted in her efforts to reform the curriculum that Mary Clark Thompson offers to build a magnificent library on Vassar's campus, which contains no less than nine seminar rooms as part of its core design. She spares no expense in her choice of architects, materials, or splendor in general, hiring the Boston firm of Collins and Allen, and ordering Tennessee marble and Germantown granite for the stonework. At this time, 
Few American universities and even fewer colleges have freestanding libraries of any kind, since most of American higher education is still based on the British medieval model, which does not require extensive research collections. And no educational institution in the United States can boast of a library of this architectural radiance at this time. The only institution that has a library even remotely like Mary's is Harvard in its Gore Hall, which provides something of an architectural model for Francis Allen's perpendicular Gothic design. So on the facade here, you can see on the left the aspirations of Mary and her colleagues to build a rival to the great universities of the English speaking world with the seals of Harvard, Oxford, Yale and Cambridge framing a band of seals that were then four of the seven sisters, Vassar, Wellesley, Bryn Mawr, and Smith. So here is the seal of Yale with light and truth in Hebrew on the upper left. Here, the Veritas of Harvard on the upper right. On the lower left is the seal of Oxford University. And on the lower right here, the coat of arms of Cambridge. And then here you have in this band, four of the seven sisters. You have Vassar's Minerva standing in front of the Parthenon here. You have the Cairo of Wellesley College. You have the medieval gate of Bryn Mawr College and then the Virgin Mary with her feet on the moon of Smith College. Reflecting back on Julia Holloway's book and the age old exclusion of women from the academy since its inception, this is almost a manifesto in stone. You can see there is some sense of common mission here among Vassar sisters common with one another, but also integrating itself into the educational tradition generally. And then on the right here is a beautiful set of elevations and drawings by Francis Allen. On this ground plan here, on the right hand slide, you can see four of the seminar rooms here that are literally around the core of the central tower. Uh, these four seminar rooms are on the first floor and on the second floor which you can't see here there are two more rooms on the east side of the tower and then on a third level there are three more rooms here across the facade and then two additional rooms above these rooms which makes then 11 rooms total with two of the rooms on the ground floor here functioning both as a circulation office. This was a circulation office, still is. And then uh, this room was alternatively a map room and a newspaper room from its inception. But all the other rooms, nine rooms, were used for seminar rooms. And all the rooms have shelving on which was placed books related to the seminars that took place in those rooms. These are two of these seminar rooms today. The one on the left is the only room that meets accessibility requirements today for a classroom and is the room I use myself for my allegory seminar where the tapestries, as you can see, are close at hand. So I have them both read the tapestries and the Apuleius text for an early assignment. And then on the right is one of the doors into a seminar room on the third floor of the tower, which we can only use now for offices and storage. The seals are part of an integrated visual program within the library that Mary Thompson personally oversaw. This is the Cornaro window she commissioned for the space designed by John Hardman and son of Birmingham, England, August Pugent's glassmakers, showing either the defense or the degree granting ceremony and the arts and sciences Elena had been examined for in allegorical form here in the lodge and just above. Hardman and Pugent's children married and it was Pugent's grandson by his first daughter, Anne Dunstan John Powell, who designed our glass at Mary Thompson's instruction. And we actually have correspondence where Mary is suggesting changes in the original design through her architect, Francis Allen. 
Powell had more red and deep blue in his early cartoons, which Mary thought made the window look too religious. So she substituted for Elena's gown, Vassar's own colors, rose and gray. And she also felt he originally had too many figures looking on from the background, which Powell did remove. So she seems to have had a good eye for form. I should mention in my reading of the library, the significance of the printer's marks, which Salmon speaks of in her essay, and which I think were important emblems of her view of the progress of history. There are 67 of these symbols embedded in the library window letting throughout the library, which give a sense of the proliferation of print culture and also framed by the alcoves of the library's open shelving, the democratization of reading and learning in Western history. One of Salmon's lessons consisted of her having her students examine their history textbooks as evidential sources for historical speculation as objects. And I'm sure one of the questions she would have wanted her students to ask is, what is the implication that these works are products of mass production? So political history, which includes the history of the progress of women in society, is linked in these objects to the progress of access to learning, which received, of course, a huge boost with Gutenberg's invention and its consequences. And I say, of course, with scholarly backing here. One Vassar student who certainly absorbed something of this history written on the library walls was Elizabeth Eisenstein, who graduated from Vassar in 1945 and went on to receive her MA and PhD in history from Radcliffe College. She taught history at Salmon's own alma mater at the University of Michigan and wrote a revolutionary history about what she called an unacknowledged revolution entitled The Printing Press as an Agent of Change, which she published in 1979. The book documents the influence of the invention and dissemination of works printed with movable type on the Renaissance and Reformation, the scientific revolution, and its emancipatory effect on human culture and consciousness in general, and makes explicit much of what is implied in Lucy Salmon's essay on reading the library as evidence of historical change. Also integral to the visual program of the library is our set of five gobelin tapestries woven in Bruges in the second quarter of the 17th century, which Mary Thompson had Francis Allen obtained from a Paris auction house. The tapestries depict the Cupid and Psyche excursus in Apuleius's second century prose novel, The Metamorphosis or The Golden Ass. How important are these tapestries to the program of a library, you might well ask, and I think I can answer that question. You can see the architecture itself has taken the hanging of these tapestries into consideration. There is the detail, of course, of the archer's embrasure, for one, which links the narrative to the dramatic space of the room, drawing everyone passing into the library through the space into the drama taking place in the tapestries by making of them a possible target of Cupid. More importantly, in the English perpendicular style that Alan was copying, walls do not ordinarily have this kind of undecorated stone surface. On the right is a classic example at Westminster, designed in part, incidentally, by August Pugin. Everything elsewhere in our library is covered with tracery, so I think we can confidently say Alan designed this space to feature these tapestries. Also, this central crossing of the library is not at the top of the central aisle, but it's near the front door, where the interior of the tower forms a kind of front lobby to the building. Besides the tapestries, there isn't a crossing a fireplace with seating for visitors and repeated seals from Ivy League male colleges paired with those of our sisters, which helped to decorate the upper reaches of the space, as well as the fireplace where Vassar and her sisters again appear. So this is an intentional showcase. 
The idea is that Vassar women could host and impress their boyfriends here from Harvard and Yale and girlfriends from Wellesley and Smith who would get a sense that they were all part of one big happy academic family. Also, since on the freeze, each female undergraduate college is paired with a university, many of which are granting advanced degrees to women at this time, there is a stimulus for women to go on to graduate programs to become college teachers themselves, a message infused with energy by the soaring perpendicular space of this 50-foot tower. Also, when you think about it, as a building record, this whole structure is quite remarkable and something of an example of an enactment of female power itself. I mean, how often does a client dictate the visual program of an important building to an architect? But I'm sure that these ladies knew what they wanted in this building, which was such an important aspect of their whole progressive endeavor here. And Mary Thompson was their willing and very persuasive agent. Before I move into a reading of the tapestries in their new context, I should briefly mention two more members of the Vassar faculty who may have been influential in their selection and deployment. Both, like Salmon, are charismatic teachers with reputations that go well beyond the walls of the institution, and both received their undergraduate degrees, in this case, at Vassar itself, and then did indeed go on to receive graduate degrees at Ivy League universities to become college teachers. The first is Elizabeth Hazelton Haight, who had a distinguished career as a classics scholar. She received her BA from Vassar in 1894 and then a master's degree in 1899 joined the Vassar faculty in 1902, and then went on to receive a PhD from Cornell in Greek poetry in 1909, working on her dissertation while she was teaching. Hate is important to the story because she writes on Apuleius and also on the tapestries and may have been influential in their acquisition and certainly was in their use as educational models. Also, I should mention Laura Johnson Wiley, who graduated from Vassar in 1877 as valedictorian of her class, went on to be a member of the first class of female PhD candidates at Yale, receiving her doctorate in 1894, and then returned as a professor of English to Vassar in 1899, where she almost immediately was made department chair. She was known for what was termed her organic approach to her discipline and to teaching, which privileged the creative energies of a student and made no distinction between art and scholarship. The idea was to foster a living sense of literature and writing, and she also emphasized, especially in her Shakespeare courses, her students' performative responses to the texts. She also founded, by the way, a local women's suffrage organization. And I wanted to include her here because I think Laura Wiley represents another side of this melding of research and charismatic modeling that is going into this new form of undergraduate education at Vassar. The object is student empowerment after all, and in some way the student's own body is one of these sources that needs to be engaged with directly along with that of her faculty models when we talk about going to the source. And I remember being struck while reading Stephen Jagger's Envy of Angels that he notes that the term documenta is applied in the context of the charismatic education of cathedral schools to the body of the professor as well as to the textual documents being studied. This oscillation between source-based research and personal growth works in well here with my own experience of teaching and teaching allegory especially, an idiom where, as Maureen Quilligan describes it, these slippery tensions between literalness and metaphor can lead to a redemptive polysemy. This is my original allegory class in the still usable seminar room I showed you earlier. 
The images of the tapestries themselves, I should mention, come out much more clearly in these digital images than one can read from looking up at them from the ground, especially with all the fading that has occurred since we hung them in 1905. The clear story windows above them were casting direct sunlight on the tapestries for almost 100 years before we placed UV film on them in the year 2000. Also, the tapestries aren't hung in perfect order. The two tapestries on the east wall here should be swapped with the tapestry on the south wall for them to be read consecutively clockwise from the first tapestry on the north wall shown on the right. And this is a close-up of that first tapestry. The scene depicts Psyche here with her parents who are receiving two suitors who have come to ask for the hands of her older sisters. Psyche is looking on, somewhat forlorn. There is more than a suggestion in Apuleius that although people are inclined to worship Psyche for her beauty, they are also afraid of her and with good reason since her beauty and their worship of it is bound to stir up the jealousy and wrath of Venus. In the context of the library and the college, if we extrapolate a bit and read Psyche's beauty as what Shelley calls intellectual beauty, it makes a certain sense when you think, especially in American culture, of the kind of resentment and envy intellectual gifts inspire. And I should add, especially female intellectual gifts. So although Psyche is regarding one of the suitors herself here with a kind of envious desire, it seems, maybe, she is already an outsider. For a young woman entering this academic atmosphere at this time, where a step on the road to the life of the mind is a step away from the conventions of marital happiness, and where the campus is something at this time of a cloister, as Edna St. Vincent Millay had complained, the emotions in the story, even as Apuleius tells it, the loneliness of Psyche, I mean, which she actually emphasizes very much in the early part of his narrative, maps very well onto our early institution. The second tapestry depicts the scene of Psyche's father consulting the oracle of Apollo at Miletus to ask what to do about her. The growing rift between Psyche and the world of her parents and sisters is apparent here. This is, for one, an allegory of allegories and a scene of literal demonization, often a problem with allegorical interpretation. Cupid is forecast by the priest of the oracle as death and as a great snake who will marry Psyche and destroy her and possibly everyone associated with her. And you can see in the tapestry figures here, this is the priest here who is pointing to something he's reading on the ground, possibly entrails. This is a statue of Apollo, and this is Psyche's father here, who's gazing directly at the statue. This is Psyche behind him in her wedding attire. These are either retainers of Psyche's father or assistants of the priest who are preparing the animals for sacrifice. And then here in the background, there's a scene of Psyche again being carried on a litter under her father's supervision off to the cliffside. Funny thing, when I first saw this background scene, I was talking to a group of parents in early September who had just dropped off their first year students. And I wondered whether they would think I was implying that dropping off your child to college was a kind of death sentence, but I don't think so, and it turned out not to be in Psyche's case in the narrative. So what the scene is about, the priest has predicted that Psyche will be visited by a demon, and she must be gotten out of town, left on a cliffside where it is assumed she will leap to her death, a kind of capital punishment. And there's the metaphor there that she will marry death. Venus does become incensed at Psyche, but rather than send a monster, she sends down her son to do a number on her, cause her to fall in love with an animal or a low-born human or whatever. Unfortunately, or perhaps fortunately for Cupid, he pricks himself on his own arrow and falls in love with Psyche when he sees her. 
And so he has Zephyrus carry her down from the cliff and set her at the bottom of a beautiful valley where he builds her a magical palace where all her needs are met and where he visits her every night under the admonition that she not try to see him or find out who he is. But it's a happy turn of events for Psyche in any case, who is lonely still, but she does have a kind of mysterious husband in a beautiful palace where she is surrounded by miracles. If we close in on the two tapestries on the east wall, the tapestry on the left here depicts Psyche's two sisters visiting her at Cupid's palace. Psyche is standing and the sisters are seated in front of her. Interestingly, the palace isn't itself depicted very well. One would expect this to be an opportunity for showing off opulence and extravagant decor, but perhaps this was intentional on the part of the patrons who were probably French aristocrats of the Ancien Regime who commissioned these tapestries, whose own palaces they may have wanted to stand in for and therefore not compete with that aspect of the narrative. And this, I think, works well for us here, where the library serves as a perfect stand-in in the context of the life of the mind for Cupid's magical palace, where almost anything Psyche thinks comes to pass, where she's bathed, treated to music, and fine food, but where she's still also very lonely. The sisters you can see aren't of much comfort or company. The nearer sister here is engaged in what one of my students called pearl clutching, implying she is projecting her own envy onto Psyche. The sisters out of envy convince Psyche to disobey her husband's admonition about not seeing him, and they also furnish her with a knife to kill the snake the priest has predicted Cupid to be. But this murder doesn't come to pass, and the sisters in the story come to a grisly end. As you can see here in the upper left corner of the tapestry, just barely, where they are shown falling headlong down the mountainside as they're punished for their envious treachery and lack of integrity with a kind of poetic justice by being torn limb from limb on the fall down the mountainside when Zephyrus is nowhere to be found uh, when they jump off for the third time, hoping Cupid will then marry them. The right-hand tapestry on the east wall is about Psyche's quest to reunite with Cupid, suggesting to my allegory class the research process. Cupid abandons Psyche when she follows her sister's advice to try to get a glimpse of him and then murder him, which causes her to spill hot oil on him from her lamp, which awakens him from his sleep. As she drops the knife her sister has given her on the floor, Cupid decamps out of a window and essentially he returns to his mother. Psyche pursues him, but she not only has to find him, but she has to deal with a still angry Venus who tracks her down and then gives her a series of impossible labors to perform. In this case, the tapestry depicts the last and most dangerous trial to which Venus sets Psyche, the retrieval of a container of beauty from Persephone in the underworld. At the left of the tapestry, Psyche is delivering the jar to Venus, so it's the end of the episode. And then on the right, Cupid has just reunited with Psyche by waking her up from the effect of the sleep that is actually in the jar, which he had opened like Pandora, and then Cupid sets her on her way again. Each of Venus's labors contains tasks which allegorize cognitive processes, matching and sorting seeds in the first task, and in this task, not only retrieving, but testing by observation the contents of the jar. Psyche's curiosity, or what the old woman narrating the story in the Metamorphosis calls sticking her nose in, brings about a miniature version of the descent into the unknown Psyche has just undertaken through this sleep. And this is followed by her redemption by love and the agency of nature that Cupid represents. And I think this maps very well onto the research process and even onto going to the source. In this case, the source is shrouded in mystery, like the underworld itself, out of which, through curiosity, Psyche derives knowledge with the help of Cupid, 
who represents love and the agency of nature. So we have beauty and knowledge distilled from desire and darkness leading to a transformation. And here we have this transformation. This is the last tapestry in situ aligned intentionally with the Cornaro window. Both depict a metamorphosis or an apotheosis, Psyche's acceptance onto Olympus and immortality in the scene of the wedding banquet in the tapestry and Elena Cornaro's reception of the doctorate at Padua in the window. In this context, where the Cornaro window depicts an historical event that throws light back on the tapestries, the integrity of the visual program becomes clearer. This is a call to the academic life where women like Lucy Salmon are providing a pathway for women like Hazel Haight and Laura Wiley to become professors themselves to carry on the program. So the program is able to propagate itself. Sustainability, or what Mary Lyon called the vital principle, was an extremely important goal for the originators of institutions of female education through the 19th century. This is a detailed view of the last tapestry. You can see Cupid restraining the still angry Venus. Mercury on the lower left has just carried Psyche up to Olympus. Jove is presiding in the center here. Over the whole scene, where he will pass judgment by ordering that Psyche become immortal by drinking the ambrosia thereby mollifying her new mother-in-law, since there won't be the social and ontological rift between Psyche and Venus's son when they marry. On the left here, you have Mars with a spear and shield, oddly resembling Sylvester Stallone. Juno with her crown here. And then you have Minerva with the moon in her hair here, Poseidon with his trident here next to Jove, Apollo with the sun behind him here, and then another mortal who has just been made a god, also Hercules with his lion skin, the only other mortal who has been allowed to become immortal also after a series of labors, so there's some legal precedent for Jove making Psyche immortal and a wider view with the seals of Harvard and Vassar above. This is the very toss of Harvard and this is the seal of Vassar. So we have here the graduate and undergraduate institutions, the call to the academic life, its heavenly and earthly rewards below and the soaring architectural space of the tower above. And I have had students say after our class was over that they felt like they should be able to levitate up in the library crossing as they were leaving our classroom and walk into this tapestry scene. No reflection on me or my teaching, honestly, but I think a reflection that says something about the power of allegory supported in this case by this architectural space as a transformational idiom that elides, as Quilligan says, the literal and the metaphoric in the source to which one goes. This is Claude Lorraine's depiction of Cupid's palace, where there is a suggestion of this blurring between the ideal and the real in the sfumato, with Psyche in the foreground in a pose that signals reflection, coincidentally identical with the one we saw earlier in the portrait of Mary Clark Thompson. And this is the Thompson Library in a winter fog. The library, like the palace, is a liminal space after all. It's full of ghosts whom I think deserve to be remembered, dead authors and teachers who have handed the past off to us and ask us to partake and also carry something forward. It is where the real is made conceptual and the conceptual is in turn reified in a performative and imaginatively polysemous way. 
Allegory, I think, reflects in this way the process where new knowledge is created from old knowledge and where the redemptive possibilities of charismatic modeling come to life, since we aren't just talking about transparent texts, but texts embodied in people and objects. Perhaps a better illustration of this attenuation of the ideal and the real that allegory in particular offers can be found in examples of Venetian fresco paintings, such as this representation of spring in the Villa Amo in Betelago, where the viewer can't distinguish architecture from paint, placing one on the same spatial plane with the gods depicted on the walls. One often feels larger than life in these art enchanted spaces of tangible metaphor. One of the early witnesses to the space and the tapestries here was Edna St. Vincent Millay, whose allegorical poem, Renaissance, which she wrote when she was 19, we read for our first assignment. Millay comes to Vassar from a very poor household held together by a single mother who divorced her husband in 1900. Her mother is poor, but she does provide Malay and her two younger sisters with culture, including exposure to music, drama, and poetry. And Malay starts writing and actually publishing her own poetry as a child. Two years after she graduates from high school, Malay is asked by an early alumna of the college, Carolyn Dow, if she wishes to come to Vassar after Dow hears Malay recite Renaissance at a hotel party where Malay's sister works as a waitress. Malay accepts and is soon placed under the tutelage of Hazelton Haight, who starts her reading Latin prose even before she arrives at Vassar to satisfy entrance requirements, almost certainly Apuleius' Metamorphosis, and where she also will become a student of Laura Wiley in English. This is a photo of Malay at about the time she entered Vassar on the left and on the right in front of main building at a later date, possibly her senior year. So the poem Renaissance was for Malay a kind of rebirth and transformational passageway between the very real and the ideal where her talent finds nourishment and support. Interestingly, and even prophetically, the poem is about truth in poetry and poetic vocation, or about her own spiritual and now physical apotheosis in her movement into the fundamental ontology of poetic language. This is an image of the Malay home in Maine, where she spent most of her childhood, and a photograph of her at a pageant celebrating Vassar's 50th anniversary where she has a part in a tableau playing an important female contributor to Western letters, Marie de France. Malay, as you can see, was very much a drama queen. She had wanted a career at one time on the stage and performed semi-professionally in plays in Maine before she came to Vassar, and then after Vassar in Greenwich Village with the Provincetown Players. And performance is, after all, a way to negotiate the real and the fictional in a bodily way. Malay also eventually meets her own Cupid, a wealthy Dutch coffee merchant, Jugen Bossevin, who helps her to purchase her farm in Austerlitz, which they call Steepletop, and who marries her and immediately saves her life by providing her with a means for a needed operation. And then he supports her in every possible way throughout her career. Funny thing about that, talking about negotiating reality and fiction through drama, is that she meets him when they are both cast in an amateur play as two people who meet and fall in love. It's also a bit of a coincidence that, like Psyche, Malay has two sisters, the youngest and most competitive of whom follows her to Vassar and eventually meets a rather sad end in madness and alcoholism. Malay uses imagery from classical literature, including the Cupid and Psyche story in her poetry, including her poems, Ode to Silence, Prayer to Persephone, Sappho Crosses the Dark River into Hades, Fatal Interview, and her poem, The Hardy Garden. 
The Hardy Garden I read as a metaphor for Vassar itself and as something of a meditation on the concept of the term female seminary. In a class discussion, I had a student read beyond the assignment in Malay's work who linked the poem to the tapestries by parsing the line from the poem, how far from home in a world of mortal burdens is love that may not die and is forever young as an indication reading from Malay back to Apuleius that the Apuleius narrative is a Romeo and Juliet story where Cupid is as forlorn and displaced as is Psyche by their family's interference in a forbidden love. Malay's poem is about perennials and annuals where you have two kinds of immortality, one procreative and one not, which map I think for her onto heterosexual and homoerotic relationships with the latter identified with perennials as opposed to the seed of a season of heterosexual desire. Gods, like perennials, are able to propagate by division asexually, as does Venus, who springs from the severed genitals of Kylus. There's some literary precedent for this, perhaps, in Swinburne's Garden of Proserpine. Several of Malay's mentors at Vassar, including Salmon and Wiley, had what were at the time called Boston marriages with female companions, and Haight and Malay, who called one another Hazel and Vincent, were at least unconventionally familiar. They remained loyal friends, and Haight wrote Malay a beautiful obituary in the Vassar Quarterly when Malay died in 1950, which begins with the sentence, Once I taught a genius and she became my friend. Malay had female lovers at Vassar and later in life, and she devotes some of her most beautiful poetry to these individuals, especially Dorothy Coleman, who died in the influenza pandemic of 1918, to whom she devotes the series of poems, Memorial to DC, that contains the poem, Prayer to Persephone. So reading the Hardy Garden as a reading of the tapestries Vassar offers a different kind of vital principle or creative extension into the future than does conventional marriage, one where the culture of women, the germ secure, is passed on and preserved through word of mouth and formulae through poetry. I also had a class insist after they became familiar with Malay and her story that we save a space for her at our overcrowded seminar table for her ghost which everyone enthusiastically wanted me to do. So the whole class was invested from the beginning in this interconnectedness between fact and fiction that allegory affords. The reading of Cuban Psyche that comes to my mind before any other was by a student I had this fall, a young man from Montana who entitled his essay, The Meaning of the Divinification of Love in Cupid and Psyche. He sets up a binary between Psyche's solipsistic isolation and loneliness on the one side and her connection with the universe on the other in Cupid's attention, where love represents this connection with others. And I should say, I didn't entirely buy this until he began using quotations from the text for support for his argument. Psyche's original isolation is described by Apuleius in his sentence, Psyche sits at home alone, wailing and weeping her isolation in agony in her mind. When she's taken into Cupid's palace, he writes, Psyche realized that her blessed state was the gift of the gods. And then my student goes on to say how trust in others outside oneself is an essential element of this new state, which is, after all, what Cupid asks of Psyche, that she trusts him without seeing him. It's an interesting reading, I believe, where, like Malay, he finds Apuleius exploring the nature of immortality in this connectedness. So for me, the beauty of all of this is that these tapestries and this story have vitality and a life. The story means something to these young people as it is passed on to them, and it gives our whole academic endeavor here an added history and a body of a kind. This is a photograph taken by Millie Budney on the left here on a reunion weekend here of myself with 
an alumna, Sally Kyle, viewing the tapestries. And then on the right is Sally again at Steepletop with a statue of Cupid, a Native American Cupid, but a Cupid nonetheless, very sweet piece really. Uh, this is one of only two works of sculpture on the estate, the other being a bust of Sappho on a column in the living room of the house. And you can see the house in the distance there in the background. And then finally, a parting photo here of Vincent Millay posing on the bed in her reference library on the upper floor of the house, where there is a small portrait of Sappho as well. And then on the right is one of my classes on a field trip to Steepletop before it was closed to visitors because of funding difficulties. The Edna St. Vincent Millay Society is very much in need of a large donation to their endowment to open Steepletop to the public again. So spread the word if you know anyone with the resources who might be willing to make an important contribution to the culture of American letters. So with that, thank you all for your attention and patience.